welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about cancer genomics. So here we are in the frontiers part of the class. So we've basically completed our uh, five modules of aligning and modeling genomes, uh, gene expression and networks, gene regulation and epigenomics, population and disease genetics, and comparative genomics and evolution. So this module, we're going to be talking about cancer genomics today, single cell genomics on Tuesday, FIWAS, actually not Tuesday, but next Thursday, FIWAS on the lecture 23, and then uh, genome engineering. So these are very much frontiers. These are current research directions of the field. And, uh, you know, these lectures are changing very rapidly as the field is evolving. So today uh, on cancer genomics, we're going to be looking at the foundations of understanding cancer. So talking about oncogenes, tumor suppressors, and the hallmarks of cancer. Then we're going to talk about uh, tools for discovering recurrence and heterogeneity through exome sequencing. Then we're going to talk about whole genome sequencing, going beyond just protein coding exons to non-coding drivers and convergence, and then going beyond mutations uh, to study epigenomic changes in cancer and also functional heterogeneity. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about tumor immunology and how the tumor interacts with the immune microenvironment of the cell and how we can exploit these understanding to, to drive immunotherapy. So let's start with the hallmarks of cancer. So Bob Weinberg and Doug Hanahan wrote a review for Cell in 2000 titled The Hallmark of Cancer, and they attempted to characterize what differentiates a tumor from a normal cell. And they summarized the acquired capabilities of cancer in six different categories and four new ones in 2011. So how do you think about these capabilities? These are basically skills that the tumor needs to gain in order to become a tumor. So one of them is how to avoid apoptosis, how to avoid the signals from a cell that maintain cells in check with other cells. The second one is how to become self-sufficient in the growth signals. So cells in the body don't just grow whenever they feel like it, they receive signals from other cells and from their environment that basically tell them when it's okay to grow. So you can think of these as the gas pedal and the brakes. So on one hand, the gas pedal is basically stuck down. On the other hand, the brakes are broken and you can't brake anymore. So these cells will continue dividing. But that's not everything you need. The cells will also have humongous energy needs. So there's uh, another one of those capabilities, which is the tumor will send signals to the surrounding uh, environment to basically sustain angiogenesis. They, they basically uh, are vessels that grow towards the tumor to feed it with oxygen and blood and give it the nutrients that it needs in order to continue growing. So the, the next one is the tumors themselves uh, will not be able to divide if they were normal cells because every cell has a built-in safety that basically only make, lets it divide a certain number of times before its telomeres, for example, get too short or because, before you know, all kinds of things go wrong. Whereas the tumors are able to replicate infinitely. And that's another one of those capabilities, basically being able to continue replicating. The next one is tissue invasion and metastasis. So the tumor cannot simply grow in place but there's actually an evolutionary advantage if that tumor can now colonize other parts of the body. Again, the tumor doesn't try to kill you, but every mutation that makes it grow more is actually positively selected. And this is one of those positively selected mutations that basically allow for invasion of metastasis. And the next one is the environment is usually sending signals that prevent growth and the tumor basically becomes insensitive to those signals. So the way to understand tumor biology versus normal cell biology is the wonder of uh, multicellularity, basically as cells acquired the capabilities to um, work together in a single organism, they basically had to play nice. They had to uh, come up with a set of uh, 
skills that actively prevent tumors. And basically what cancers do is actively suppress each of those things to basically immortalize those cells. So these are the hallmarks that were listed in 2000, but again, a huge amount of cancer research has happened since then. And there are four emerging hallmarks that were uh, recently recognized. One of them is cellular energetics itself. So basically within the cell, the production of energy is mostly um, uh, carried out by the mitochondria. And these mitochondria are deregulated and now are able to now produce a huge amount of more energy. The second one is that cells interact with the environment and they will, with the immune environment of the, of the body, and they usually show um, signals that basically tell the body, yes, I'm doing fine, you know, don't, you don't have to uh, take me out or uh, communicate in general, but the tumor cell is able to actually avoid immune destruction by interacting with the immune system. The third one is genome instability and mutation. So you would think that maintaining the genome intact is something that every cell should do in order to survive. And that's true for most cells, but the tumor has actually an advantage to creating instability and creating hypermutation because this actually allows it to play the number, the numbers game. Namely, if nine out of 10 cells die, but one out of 10 acquires additional mutations that make it more tumor-like, that's perfectly, perfectly fine for a tumor because the one that gets lucky, quote unquote, will then expand to make many, many more progenies. So destabilizing the genome and creating a mutator phenotype that actually increases the mutation rate is extremely beneficial to the tumor because it can actually get away with killing a lot of tumor cells that are not beneficial and that are not having an intact genome and therefore lead to a small number of cells that have acquired these additional beneficial mutations. So it basically cranks up the search space, if you wish, while killing off branches that are less helpful. And the last one is tumor promoting inflammation. So there's um, another interaction with the immune system in the inflammatory system that actually brings it additional immune cells that it can then co-opt and then use to perhaps go elsewhere in the body or bring energy to it through these inflammatory processes and so on and so forth. So any questions so far? Who's with me on these hallmarks of cancer? So this was a way to group all of the knowledge that folks had acquired about genes that were usually mutated and so on and so forth to distill it into a small number of capabilities. So um, this is great, 100, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the order in which the tumor acquires these capabilities does not matter as long as it acquires all of them. So in some cases, it'll be one mutation of each and maybe two mutations in that category that then leads to the tumor becoming a tumor. In other cases, a single mutation might actually be uh, both evading apoptosis and increasing angiogenesis, for example as long as the tumor ultimately acquires all these capabilities. And the way that you should think about tumor biology is that there's an immense number of possible paths to become a tumor, because for any one of these capabilities, there are many, many genes. And for any one of those genes, there are many, many enhancer regions that you could dysregulate. So you have to think of the tumor as heterogeneity being its very definition that ultimately leads to these capabilities. And every single tumor in the body will effectively find a different combination of mutations and paths that lead it to these uh, set of capabilities. So there's many, many pathways and every tumor finds a different path to it. And here's some examples of paths. 
to become self-sufficient in growth signals, you could activate the RAS oncogene. To become insensitive to anti-growth signals, you could lose retinoblastoma suppressor. To evade apoptosis, you could basically produce IGF survival factors. To make your replicative potential infinite, you could turn on telomerase and basically keep expanding your telomeres. To sustain angiogenesis, you could pr produce this VEGF inducer that actually is a signal for um, these um, for angiogenesis to happen, and to uh, invade other tissues and allow metastasis, you could basically inactivate E coherin. So, and the 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 molecular mechanism through which these pathways are enabled and these specific changes can happen. And you can see that these include both inactivation and activation, both loss and gain of different types of functions. This is through a combination of germline mutations. And this is everything that we've talked about so far. So we've talked about common variants and we've talked about rare variants. So when we looked at genome-wide association studies, there are thousands of genetic variants that are weakly associated with cancer through genome-wide association studies. And this is effectively the focus of our lectures on genetics. But there are also rare variants which are themselves inherited, which are stronger effects sometimes, that are also coming from the germline. But where the tumor actually differs is these somatic mutations. So somatic mutations are mutations that happen after the conception of the initial cell that forms as the, as the initial zygote is dividing to create the embryo. And as our cells are dividing throughout our lifetime to basically continue producing you know, you know, higher people, uh, taller, uh, bigger, and so on and so forth as we grow to adulthood and also to replenish our cells when we are cut or when you know, some cells die or when you're burned and so on and so forth, there's continued cell divisions. So every single time that you renew your skin through sun exposure or that you regrow your adipocytes uh, you know, as, they, uh, re as they get replenished, nearly every cell of your body, except perhaps for some of your neurons, is undergoing replacement as you go through life. So, you know, there's this um, philosophical uh, dilemma of, uh, hey, when you start replacing a plank of a ship every year, and eventually after a few years, there's not a single plank of the original ship, is it still the same ship? And in the same way, your body replenishes itself constantly. And, you know, at some point, all of your cells will have been renewed except again, for some of your neurons. So during every one of those cell divisions, there is a potential for somatic mutations. And what's really dramatically different in the way that we an uh, uh, analyze germline mutations versus somatic mutations is that somatic mutations are subject to positive selection. Because if any of those makes the tumor more likely to replicate, it will be amplified. Whereas for germline mutations, the main force that we've been talking about is purifying selection. So negative constraint, whereas this is positive constraint. Okay, so that's for somatic mutations. And then in addition to those, there are gene regulatory alterations that will basically change the expression of a cell or a gene or a pathway and so on and so forth. So cancer can be thought of as a combination of germline, somatic, but also epigenomic changes, gene regulatory alterations that will then give rise to complex phenotypes. So there's many paths and those paths don't need to be all somatic. They don't need to all be all germline. They don't need to be all epigenomic. They can be a combination of those. So you have some germline mutations that have low, moderate or high penetrance. And then you can look for somatic mutations that are genetic or genomic, or that are changing gene expression patterns, or that are changing signaling. And those are indeed, uh, are, are then leading to somatic histopathology or specific biomarkers, and then ultimately clinical progression and so on and so forth. And in response to therapy, you can actually select additional mutations 
after that. Another key concept that uh, it is important to realize in the, in the context of tumors is that not every mutation is a driver mutation. You basically acquire a huge number of mutations on the path to getting your first driver mutation. What's a driver mutation? A driver mutation is a mutation that actually contributes to some of these capabilities of the cancer. Whereas a passenger mutation is just yet another mutation that happens along for the ride. And again, this is an evolutionary process. There's an enormous number of mutations, only some of which will actually be driving the tumor progression. So again, oncologists differentiate between driver and passenger. Drivers confer an advantage to the growth of the tumor. Passengers do not directly contribute to the fitness of the tumor, but they are along for the ride. And the challenge, of course, is going to be how do we distinguish which ones are drivers and which ones are, are passengers? The way that we usually do that is to look for recurrent mutations across different patients that deactivate the same pathways. And that will tell us that these are more likely to be driver events. So you have an, in, an intrinsic mutational process, some environmental and lifetime exposures, and eventually you might gain a mutation that makes DNA replication more error prone, or that makes DNA repair less active. And then suddenly you have a mutator phenotype. And the moment you acquire that mutator phenotype, many, many more mutations start accumulating and you're gaining many additional drivers. So it's not a one-time shot evolutionary process. Some of these mutations are in fact facilitating other mutations. And in particular, this genome instability concept is one of those where if you gain that capability, then you're much, much more likely to, to achieve the other ones more rapidly. So let's see uh, who's with me so far on this combination of events across different pathways and on the difference between passenger and driver mutations. Awesome, so 80, 20, 0, 0, 0. Okay, again, there's many mutated genes that can drive cancer emergence. Mutations that drive tumorigenesis can be one of four different things. Number one, they can be oncogenes, these are the things that create the tumor, or they can be tumor suppressors. These are the things that take out the breaks from becoming a tumor. They could be mutator genes. These are genes that increase genomic instability. And they could also be epimutator. These are dysregulations that create this increased mutation rate. So these proto-oncogenes are genes that normally promote and direct normal cell growth but when mutated, they become hyperactive, they become oncogenes, and then they stimulate overactive growth. So on one hand, you basically have more of the gas pedal. On the other hand, you have tumor suppressors. These are genes that normally slow down cell division. And when mutated, they can show a loss of function and gain unchecked cell growth. So these are gain of function, and these are loss of function mutation. So gain of the gas pedal, loss of the stop pedal. And again, mutator genes, as we talked about earlier, regulate genomic stability. And if they're mutated, there's more instability, more chances for the tumor to reach one of those beneficial states. So P53 is an example of a tumor suppressor. So it serves as the guardian of the genome normally, and it serves as a key link between DNA damage and repair. As soon as P53 senses that there's some kind of abnormality or DNA damage or hypoxia or there's something wrong with the cell cycle. It does two things. Number one, it stops the cell cycle. It basically says, don't divide anymore. And it starts DNA repair. And then if it manages to repair the problem, then it can restart the cell cycle. Or it can lead to apoptosis. And this is program self Cell, cell death. This is self-suicide of a cell, which realizes that it can no longer be beneficial to the organism. But when P53 mutates, there could be DNA damage or cell, cell cycle abnormality or hypoxia, but P53 is no longer able to sense them. And therefore the cell cycle can continue and the cells can become cancers. 
So mutations in P53 can cause loss of function and promote tumor emergence and growth. So P53 is normally a tumor suppressor, but when it's lost, you then have uh, the mutator phenotype. So for example, DNA breaks, UV radiation are sensed by P53. It interacts with several pathways. It controls growth versus arrest. It can control apoptosis and geogenesis. So it's at the core of this massive number of pathways. And that's why if you look at what are the, where are the mutations associated with cancer normally happening, they're happening enormously more frequently in P53 than any other gene because it's one of the, it's an easy path to cancer. So it's very frequently re-exploited, but each time through a different mutation. So there's an enormous diversity of P53 mutations that can lead to any of these dysregulations. It also controls mitochondria in apoptosis, maturation of growth suppressive microRNAs, DNA repairs, and so on and so forth. That's one example of a tumor suppressor gene. RAS is actually an example of an oncogene. So the RAS family members are small GTPases that are involved in cell growth and cell cycle pathways. And mutation in the RAS family members can actually cause rampant growth and proliferation. So you basically have RAS here at the center of a large number of pathways going through the cell cycle through phase G0, G1, and S. And RAS controls a number of processes that either inhibit the cell cycle before it begins or move through the cell cycle after it has begun. And if you have uh, mutations in the RAS family, it can basically lead to uh, aberrant growth and prol proliferation. There's many uh, members of the RAS family proteins, and they are examples of proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. So they're, um, you know, they're upstream of a large number of these pathways. You can have basically different forms of RAS, activated or not, and then when it's activated, it can lead to a large number of pathways, which include control of the cytoskeleton through actin, cell survival, signaling, endocytosis, gene expression, cell cycle, motility, apoptosis, and so on and so forth. You can also create genomic rearrangements that enable these dysregulatory events. So tumors can be driven by fusion events that create chimeric proteins that serve as oncogenes. There's a very famous example of re recurrent fusion, which involves you know, these PCR and ABL genes that drives chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML. And that's basically when there's a rearrangement between chromosome nine and chromosome 22 that brings these two genes together and then creates this uh, oncogene mutation. So this oncogene uh, concept has basically led to a therapeutic hypothesis, which is that the tumor is now putting all of its eggs in one basket, that basically it becomes addicted to a specific oncogene. Despite a very large number of genetic and epigenetic alterations, cancers are very often dependent on a few select oncogenes. And then targeting these oncogenes can actually provide an Achilles heel, a weak spot for cancer and enable targeted therapies. And there's combination treatments that can actually drive the tumor from this large evolutionary space that it explores into a more narrow space where it really becomes addicted to that oncogene. And therefore a combination treatment can number one, drive it to that dependent and number two, target the gene that it has now become dependent on. Is everybody with me here on this whole concept of an oncogene addiction and how to drive the tumor to that specific evolutionary space? Lovely. So 60, 20, 20, 0, 0. Let me know if you guys have uh, any questions. Again, we talked about mutator genes. These are mutations that lead to lower repair efficiency or increased overall tumor mutation rate. 
And these mutator genes are involved usually in DNA repair pathways and genes involved in controlling chromatin stability and movement through the M phase of the cell cycle. So you basically have normally uh, a rest in G0 or you, know, you enter G1 and the S phase, G2 and so on and so forth. And these mutator genes can prevent the cell from having all of these checkpoints that they normally have. So there's a DNA damage checkpoint and if a cell senses DNA damage, it basically stops dividing. There's another DNA damage here. There's another phase checkpoint, spindle assembly checkpoint, and so on and so forth. And these mutator genes can get rid of the checks and balances effectively of the cell cycle and lead to aberrant uh, divisions. And again, beyond individual genes, copy number variants and rearrangements are a very common uh, technique that the tumors exploit as a way to create both these oncogenes and get rid of these tumor suppressors. They have you know, many different types of genomic instability. They can be polyploid. And when we talked about whole genome duplication, this is one of the mechanisms that tumors can actually create this instability and then gain a lot of these second copy genes that can then be exploited for the tumor's advantage. Or they can be aneuploid. So polyploid means many chromosome copies, aneuploid, euploid means good chromosome copies, aneuploid means not good chromosome copies. So aneuploid means that you've gained or lost segments of a chromosome, or you might have an entire duplication of a chromosome or an entire deletion of a chromosome, and these can lead to copy number variations. So these can be dosage effects, for example, if you want to amplify a particular gene, you could simply duplicate that segment of the DNA. So you now have two different locations from which the gene is expressed. Or it could lead to rearrangements and structural variants where the context of the gene might actually change. So you might actually have gene regulatory changes where the genes are now sitting in a new context. So if you invert a particular segment, you now might have a promoter here or if you translocate it into a different chromosome, or uh, if you duplicate it, and, or if you lose it, you might actually have these uh, changes. So that's basically in introducing the concept of oncogenes and tumor suppressors and these hallmark capabilities of cancer and these um, tumor suppressors, proto-oncogenes and oncogenes, the mutator phenotype, and some of those are actually driven by viruses that will then lead to the cell becoming a tumor by creating instability. So as the virus enters your cell and starts replicating, it might actually result in a mutator phenotype that will then lead to additional mutations that might create a tumor. And again, fusion oncogenes. So let's talk about now how do we get at these tumor suppressor and oncogenes and how do we discover those? So how do we identify drivers of tumorigenesis? So a key goal of exome and whole genome profiling is to identify these driver mutations that confer positive fitness advantages to the tumor. And these mutations can be common, rare, or somatic variants. And many of the discovered genes through these are in fact the basis of these hallmarks of cancer. You know, we didn't start with our hallmarks, we ended with the hallmarks. The first step was let's identify a bunch of genes that are drivers and that are recurrently mutated. And then let's study these genes and try to understand what are these hallmarks of cancer. And there's really three types of mutations and three types of analysis. The first one, as I mentioned, is genome-wide association studies, and these are looking for weak effect, typically non-coding mutations, which are common in the population. Genetic linkage can lead to the discovery of strong effect, Mendelian mutations, which are running in families, and whole genome sequencing of exome or genome can lead to the discovery of strong effect somatic mutations that arise during the mitotic cell divisions. Again, the concept is that you might have some predisposition to cancer through some ancient mutations that are common in the population or some recent mutations that are, you know, in your great-grandpa and great-grandma. Uh, 
uh, perhaps through their exposures, through you know modern pollutants and so on and so forth. And after they make a fertilized egg, you can now have an, a series of additional mutations that are happening during these somatic uh, events. Many of them will be passengers, shown here in blue, and then there will be some initiating driver events and some additional driver events. And every one of those driver events then leads to an expansion of additional cells that can have tumor phenotypes. And you can see here the color getting darker and darker and darker as additional these capabilities of cancer are acquired. And then that tumor will now start growing and you end up with these um, mutations. So again, there's roughly one mutation every megabase. And across the genome, there's only five to 20 drivers. So there's an enormous number of passenger mutations. So, you know, if there's 3.2 billion letters in the DNA, there's 3,200 mutations, out of which only five to 20 will actually be drivers. So identifying these drivers is a challenge of a needle in a haystack problem. So who's with me so far? <clears throat> Great, so 60, 30, 15, 0, 0. So let's go through each of these. So basically from genome-wide association study, there's a large number of genetic variants that are common in the population that are associated with many different types of cancers. And you notice that not every one of them is associated with all cancers, no. Instead, you have very tumor-specific uh, changes. So that suggests that there's in fact a lot of distinct biology between different cancer types and these mutations are in fact very often tuned to the specific environment that every type of tumor lives in. So again there's hundreds of genome-wide association kits for diverse cancer types and these usually act through polygenic risk and weaker effects and they don't have any visible Mendelian inheritance. There's also a huge number of rare variants that have been associated with cancer through Mendelian genetics and linkage mapping. So from the family history of a person that has cancer, for example, we can look at who in their family had cancer and then trace the inheritance patterns of the chromosomes across these pedigrees to recognize which segments of chromosomes contain these um, mutations that are segregating in that family with cancer. So knowing the family history and the pedigrees, we can map cancer driver genes with linkage analysis. And Mary Claire King, in fact, mapped the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer on chromosome 17 in 1990 using genetic linkage analysis in families with inherited risk for breast cancer. And every family carried a different set of inherited mutations but they were recurrently hitting the same gene. And that's one of the key concepts of uh, cancer. The fact that you have to embrace the fact that every single one of these mutations will be occurring independently in each of those families. And once it's acquired, you, you will then be able to trace it. And very often they will be falling back onto the same number of small genes, this many small number of genes that lead to uh, cancer. And the third uh, technique after GWAS and rare variants and linkage analysis is somatic mutations. So this is paired sequencing of both normal and tumor tissue to look for recurrent mutations and hotspots that are implicated in cancer. The goal here is to recognize the clonal heterogeneity and the mutational diversity within a tumor. And that heterogeneity leads to actually lower allelic fractions. So when you're doing sequencing of a chunk of a tumor, every cell might actually have a different DNA. So these driver mutations might actually be a very small number of those passenger mutations. So you, what you would like to do is enrich for them. So how do you do that? Well, you could look for heterogeneity because of these lower allelic fractions. You can recognize that only a small fraction of the reads show the mutation, and you also need highly sensitive methods to actually call the mutations. So you start with whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, 
And then you compare that with between normal and tumor to recognize where are the somatic mutations rather than the germline mutations. So you sequence the, the tumor and you sequence you know, outside the tumor. You then can look for mutations that have happened multiple times, either that happen multiple times across different individuals or that show multiple disruptions within the same person. You could also predict the functional impact of these mutations. You could say, well, that's a silent mutation. It doesn't change the amino acid as opposed to, wow, that's a, you know, changing a charged amino acid into a hydrophilic amino acid. Um, so you can predict which of the mutations will more likely change the protein function. And then you could look for recurrent combinations of mutations. And then you could experimentally follow up and validate whether indeed these mutations can lead to increased replications and so forth. And that's where you start with an enormous number of passenger mutations and eventually you filter them out to only find a small number of drivers. So there's many uh, tools, computational tools for calling these somatic point mutations. So for example, Mutect is developed by Gary Getz's uh, lab and it's basically looking at the tumor reads and the normal reads and predicts which are more likely to be coming from the tumor based on a statistical enrichment above some, some threshold. And then there's many additional filters that you can apply after you found these enriched mutations. Number one, you could say, hey, is it near a gap? Is there a strand bias? Basically, if I only recognize it on the forward strand, it's more likely to be a sequencing error. But if I recognize it on both strands, it's more likely to be real. If I have multiple alleles, this might simply be a duplicated region. Or if that region is mapping poorly on the genome, I might want to reject it because I might simply be fooling myself in where it actually is going. Is it clustered by position? And if it's also observed in control, you can basically say, well, no, this is not unique to the tumor, so it's less likely to be a driver. And after you, you do that, you basically then go and search for whether it's also found in normal samples. And you can reject the ones that are also common in the population and ultimately search across dbSNP, classify it, and then you have a set of candidates, um, somatic mutations after you've excluded common variants. So this is a Bayesian classifier. It determines if the mutation is tumor specific, impaired tumor normal sequencing, even a very low allelic fraction down to 0.1 frequency. And again, notice that even in the tumor, that mutation is not covering all of the reads. For example, 90% of the tumor reads might actually not have that mutation because a small fraction of the cells have that mutation. But you can still detect it as distinct from normal, apply all these filters, and then detect it as a driver. So how do you annotate? These, uh, driver, these drivers based on their function. You could basically uh, search for gen code annotations or look for known list of DNA repair or look at the functions of these corresponding proteins. Look at known cancer variants through databases of existing previously identified mutations in cancer that you can then use to boost your power. And you could also look for non-cancer variants to exclude those. If it's a common polymorphism, it's less likely to be a driver because otherwise it wouldn't be common in the population. If it's found in thousand genomes, if it's found in the exome sequencing project and so on and so forth. So through this, we can now start asking great, I've identified all these somatic mutations, do they cluster? And that's the main evidence for recurrence and for drivers. It's the recurrence either at the nucleotide level where a specific amino acid residue might be dis repeatedly disrupted. It could be recurrence at the gene level where there could be multiple deactivations of the same gene or it could be recurrence at the pathway level where multiple genes involved in the same pathway are in fact repeatedly mutated. And if you look at BRCA1 and BRCA2, they're both recurrently mutated 
and their individual mutations are themselves recurrent. So BRCA2 is on chromosome 13. It's an autosomal dominant, and it has a role in genomic instability. And, it, and there's more than 300 different mutations that have been reported. BRCA1 is a chromosome 17. It's also autosomal dominant. And more than 500 different mutations have been uh, reported. And you can see here some of those mutations tiling on to different places in the, in the protein. And that tells you that, well, this place is probably a very good place to mutate if you're a tumor and you're trying to continue replicating or growing. So from exome analysis, we can reveal recurrently mutated genomic hotspots. So looking at, for example, 10,000 tumors across 41 different cell types. Uh, this team here uh, by Mike Snyder and, uh, and others looked at 2 million somatic hypermutations with an average number of somatic mutations of 57 per exome. And they found that, in fact, 20,000 human genes harbored hotspots. And there were 400 uh, hotspots that were affecting 275 protein coding genes. And you can see here how these hotspots are distributed across the genome. So you can see, you know, just a very large number of hotspots all falling into the same protein here. These BRAF proteins, which are a family that's very repeatedly um, mutated in cancer, you can see a large number of these mutations. So you can see here how many hotspots are there. And again, the number one is, as always, D53. There's very, there's like 50 different uh, DNA binding domain mutations. And, you know, there's some, some of them that are shown here. So again, there's two sides of cancer. On one hand, it's recurrence, that there's a small set of pathway alterations that are necessary for cancer, and these are the hallmarks of cancer, and that oncogenes and tumor suppressors are points of recurrence. And then the converse of that is heterogeneity. Cancer is an evolutionary process driven by positive selection. There's a very large number of precancer cells, which are constantly subjected to selection, and there's many ways that an oncogenic pathway can be hit. So you have to look at these clonal evolutionary properties. So again, if you look at clonal genomic heterogeneity within a single tumor, you can look for intratumor heterogeneity, which is driven by these evolutionary dynamics, and find evidence of positive selection for mutations that have fitness benefits to the cancer. And that depends on the mutation rate, the number of cell divisions, the cancer type, and so on and so forth. You know, looking at this diagram of these expansions and these driver events, you can then ask, if I do bulk DNA sequencing of different cells and I map these two call variants, then what are the dynamics of the tumor across time? And you can see these driver mutations expanding each time. And you could also have treatment intervening and changing the tumor composition. So if you sequence now at any one point, you could say, well, at that point, I could see these four different lineages. And at a later point, perhaps even after treatment, you might see a very different composition. So the image you should have in your head is not, oh, I'm sequencing this one particular cell. It's no, I'm sequencing a distribution of cells across the tumor at every time point. So again, this genomic instability can be a source of functional heterogeneity. The abnormalities can lead to instability that can lead to more mutations, that can lead to increased genetic diversity, and that can lead to increased heterogeneity. And the instability can be detrimental to the individual tumor cells, but also help escape bottlenecks by increasing the number of paths to the cancer. So emergence or resistance to chemotherapy and treatment. And these tumors, again, play the numbers game. There's very little purifying selection. It's mostly positive selection. And every single time you go through a bottleneck through treatment, for example, the tumor can then find a way out, even if there's one cell left, and then expand back into uh, additional paths to the tumor. And that heterogeneity can be found both in emergence of the tumor the first time around, as well as resistance. So for example, after treatment, you can see that their tumor cells can diminish dramatically, but all it takes is one cell to then re-expand. And then after another treatment, you basically can compress that original tumor, except for a small clone, a small 
um, part, a, a branch of that, um, of that tumor that can then acquire additional mutations and then lead to new metastasis. So this can be a response to the treatment. So the tumor is not simply evolving without any pressures. As you carry on treatment, the tumor is responding to the treatment and evolving away from that treatment. And there's a lot of micro environmental factors that can influence this. And perhaps this can also lead to a distant metastasis where there's a different microenvironment, which can then lead to a different set of mutations. So it's an evolutionary process, which is undergone sometimes in multiple locations in the body, each uh, driven by its own, its own microenvironment. And you can trace that clonal history of the multiple metastatic sites by looking for mutations that are actually shared. So for example, uh, Gerlinger uh, et al. Uh, sequenced both metastatic lesions and different locations in the primary tumor in four renal cell carcinoma patients. And these mutations were regionally distributed and could be partitioned into private, shared, and ubiquitous. And the shared could be either primary or metastatic. And you could then infer the phylogenetic relationship between the different regions of the tumor. And these ploidy profiling can also show differences in genomic instability. So ploidy is asking what is the copy number at every location. So sequencing the normal tissue, you see that even the normal tissue has an additional acquired mutation. And then there's a shared branch of the primary tumor and a bunch of private mutations in different spots of that tumor. And then there's a shared metastasis spot, which is you know, elsewhere in the body. And then again, a lot of private mutations coming out of that. So when you look at these uh, tumor cells, you basically see this large diversity of, um, uh, of phenotypes, which uh, is indicative of these different lineages living within the same tumor sample. So you can have ubiquitous mutations, you can have shared primary mutations. You can see here that you know, all of these have something, and then this is shared only with a subset. This is shared only with a different subset, and that's the metastasis. And then you have a large number of additional private mutations that are only shared with a small subset of the cells. And you can build these computational models for clonal substructure. So there's PyClone, for example, in Python, where you can build these complex models that tell you how the tumor is evolving according to you know, gamma distributions, uniform distributions, you know, binomial distributions, beta binomials, and so on and so forth. So these complex models are typically needed for discovering the underlying clonal structures and multiple measurements across either time or space are usually needed to tune the parameters of that model. And what we find is that mutational prevalence is in fact closely associated with phylogenetic history, that through the phylogeny of the tumor, you can kind of see where are the driver mutations that are leading that evolutionary process. So in our own work, in collaboration with Genevieve Bolland, we've basically been tracking a patient across three years of treatment. You can see here day 1,200, so that's like nearly four years later. And we could actually see that as we sample the same person with recurrent tumors after the first treatment, the second treatment, the third treatment, you can actually see that some of these are identifying new lineages that were previously not recognized and thought to, to have been gone. But you can see that this green lineage, this yellow lineage has, for example, reoccurred. And this blue lineage keeps jumping from different place to different place in his body and so on and so forth. So overall, we can now start tracking the specific mutations that are happening along each of these lineages and infer even recurrent events that are happening across different places. So again, there's dozens of samples from multiple lesions, multiple time points across the body, and we can use the passenger mutations to infer the phylogenetic relationship of all of the tumor samples. And once we have that phylogeny, 
we can infer the multiple tumor lineages that coexist simultaneously. And you can see that there's at least five lineages with some private uh, lineages down uh, each of these sites. And you can recognize driver events that drive tumor resistance and metastasis based on their growth and their change in abundance, as well as this convergence. For example, this genome doubling has happened twice. So you can see here that these other lineages seem to have disappeared and only that additional lineage in green is in fact seen in the final recurrence that led the patient to ultimately die. And you can see that there's in fact the genome doubling here and another genome doubling there. You can see that there's a lot of C2 mutations here in the green lineage, and then there's additional C2 mutations uh, in one of the other lineages. So you can kind of see these paths to uh, resistance for the tumor. So we talked about these lessons from exome sequencing and this concept of recurrence with common signatures across different types, different patients, different tumors, different clones, and these evolutionary dynamics of clonal heterogeneity followed by clamping down of the diversity through selection in treatment, followed by re-expansion if some of the cells of the tumor actually uh, expand and some computational models that allow us to actually capture this. If who's with me so far? <clears throat> Great. So we are at uh, 50, 50, 0, 0, 0. So this is all from exome sequencing this recurrence and heterogeneity at the gene level, at the protein coding level. But we, we are increasingly able to actually go to the whole genome and look for non-coding drivers and convergence across a much larger diversity of mutations. But that actually has additional challenges. We have to correct for the background mutation rate of different regions, of, dif of different chromatin epigenomic states across different patients and across different regulatory neighborhoods of a gene. And to recognize convergence, we have to trace mutations to the enhancers that they control and these enhancers to the genes that they control and these genes to the pathways that they belong in. So outside proteins, whole genome sequencing and non-coding mutations are this enormous additional challenge. And if you look at what fraction of total mutations are found in coding exons, they're a tiny, tiny little fraction, like less than one in a thousand. For coding introns, you know, slightly higher. Non-coding exons, non-coding introns, and then intergenic, it's enormous. So all of these things are actually sitting outside the protein coding genes. So how do we go about systematically studying that? So again, a lot of the tools that we've been covering throughout the class for understanding the epigenome, understanding motifs, understanding the non-coding landscape, understanding the circuitry, of how to link non-coding regions to their target, all of that actually comes back to bear in uh, these analyses to enable us to uh, study the recurrence in the whole genome side of things. So again, the vast majority of somatic mutations are non-coding, and the vast, vast, vast majority of those are in fact passenger mutations. And finding the drivers is enormously hard. So how can we make sense of non-coding mutations? Well, number one, recurrence, similar to coding, but there's a challenge. For protein coding mutations, it's very easy to say, oh, great, these are all in the same gene. But now we don't actually know the boundaries of the units of function. Is it an enhancer? Is it a set of enhancers? Is it the whole megabase surrounding the gene? Is it every nucleotide within that megabase? Or is it just a small subset of exons, uh, or sorry, of enhancers. Uh, number two, the background mutation rate can vary dramatically between regions, between patients, between chromatin states, and you know different segments of the DNA. And the convergence is also much harder because before, to look for convergence, there was the unit of the gene. All of the exons of the gene belong to the same gene. So now we have to actually overcome the challenge of we don't actually know what gene every non-coding region is linked to. So how do we use all of that information? 
So again, these scattered mutations can target common genes and ultimately common pathways, and convergence is actually much harder for the non-coding space. So again, there's two challenges. Number one, how do we detect the mutations? And then number two, how do we interpret the mutations? For detecting the mutations, this is all about comparing cases and controls. And for each of those, looking for cancer tissue versus normal tissue, and looking for mutations that are more abundant in the cancer tissue and that are more abundant in the cases rather than the controls. So you can have cells from the biopsy and from nearby locations that are not uh, associated with a tumor in the uh, cases. And then you also want to sample blood as a germline uh, indication and blood also from um, controls to basically make sure that the mutations that we're finding to be, that we're predicting to be drivers are not simply also very common in the controls. So then you sequence and you genotype, you identify variants, and then you can look for common and germline variants from GWAS and look for those that are enriched relative to the background or rare germline from whole genome sequencing, typically in exons, or rare somatic from whole genome sequencing that are different between the tumor and the controls, oh, sorry, between the tumor cells and the non-tumor biopsy of the cases. And then you do a statistical test for enrichment based on the odds ratio, based on a burden test. What's a burden test? That's basically adding up mutational burden through the, throughout different mutations and then uh, you know, asking whether that particular gene has more mutation that you would expect, even if they're not just at one same residue all the time, they could just be a total accumulated burden for that gene. And then you look for signals of positive selection. And then when it comes to functional prioritization, you could look for whether a particular motif is gained or lost uh, through the position weight matrices or through these deep learning models that allow you to predict the mutational impact of any new mutation in the genome, even if you haven't previously seen it. You could say, if I have a deep learning model that predicts enhancer activity or transcription factor binding, and I perturb a nucleotide, how much does that change the uh, location uh, score for that region? You could also ask, is it disrupting a region that's evolutionarily conserved? Only five to 10% of the genome is evolutionarily conserved between related mammals. So you could say, let's maybe focus only on the subset that is evolutionarily conserved as a way to prioritize uh, mutations that are more likely to be impactful. And you could also, within the network of a cell, look for centrally located nodes. And then you go in and experimentally validate the results by looking at the functional effects of these mutation in a mouse model or in a dish and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you then translate it to the clinic. So how do you correct for all of these different uh, challenges? So basically on one hand, you want to correct for the background mutation rate of your tumor. And that background mutation rate can vary dramatically. So for, for example, melanoma has a hundred times the mutation rate of um, uh, sarcoma. So here's Ewing sarcoma, you see that its mutation rate is less than you know, 0.5 mutations every one megabase, whereas melanoma, its mutation rate is actually you know, nearly 100 mutations per megabase. So there's a dramatic change here, a factor of 10 here, another factor of 10 here between different types of uh, tumors. So the second thing is not just the overall mutation rate, but the specific signatures of mutations. So if you color every substitution according to the set of nucleotides that it changes from C to T, from C to A, from C to G, and so on and so forth, you can actually see that the specific types of mutations that are happening are dramatically different between different tumor types. So from the mutations alone, you might be able to say, well, this really looks like an ovarian cancer, or this really looks like a lung cancer, and so on and so forth. The second uh, challenge is looking at the mutation profiles uh, of those different tumor types and not just correcting for the overall rate, 
but looking at these mutation profile. So these changes in these frequencies are in fact stemming simply from the mutator genes that are uh, selected in each type of tumor. And also different repair genes are most active in different tissues. So for example, lung cancer will target lung active repair genes and there's distinct mutational profiles that those genes, that those repair genes will lead to when they're mutated. So if you look at this diversity of the types of changes that are happening between C2A, C2T, uh, you know, CPG to CPT, uh, TPG, and so on and so forth, you basically have different tumors, in fact, showing very different types of mutations. Then as you walk along the genome, there's a lot of regional heterogeneity in the mutation rate. So as you go through the genome, you could say, well, where is the mutation rate the highest? And that's the curve in red. And you can see that the mutation rate is much higher in specific locations of the genome. And what's really interesting is that if you look at olfactory receptors, they show a very high mutation rate in cancer. Well, is that because they're driving cancer? The answer is no. They're usually um, also mutated outside cancer. So that's something that you, know, you need to correct for. The second challenge is that the uh, lower the expression, the more mutations a region accumulates. And the reason for that is a little counterintuitive. You would think that, wow, the regions that are utilized the most should be the ones that show the most mutations. But in fact, those regions that are the most active are also the ones that are recruiting the most DNA repair genes so that when there's a mutation there, you can actually detect it very rapidly. So the genome fights against the damage that's coming from utilization so well that it's in fact the inactive regions that are showing the higher uh, mutation rate. And also replication timing correlates with that as well. So the genes that show low expression are also the regions that are replicating late. So again, if you look at olfactory receptors, for example, you see that they have lower expression overall and they have uh, later replication overall. If you look at just random genomic locations, they're, you know, they're somewhere in the middle. And if you look at these cancer genes, they're, you know, much more highly expressed and much more early replicating. So you can correct for all that. So the mutation rate varies greatly across the genome. It correlates with replication time, with gene expression level. And olfactory receptors are long genes, and they have and long genes have the most mutations, but they're not cancer drivers. They're just highly mutated. And once you adjust for the background mutation rate, they actually disappear. So that's why it's so important to correct for that background mutation rate in order to recognize locations that are specifically hypermutated compared to the background that you would expect. And for example, here, uh, if you look at this red curve, that's not because it has a lot of driver genes. No, on the contrary, you would expect it to have more mutations, but in fact, you find that it's depleted from mutations. Whereas here, it is actually enriched from mutations. So that's why correcting for these things that correlate with the mutation rate allows you to recognize uh, true driver genes and true driver regions. So who's following with me so far? <clears throat> Lovely, so 2080.00. Again, the mutation rate varies with DNA accessibility. The repair machinery is optimized for accessible sites, which would otherwise become hypermutated due to that access. In cancer, however, the repair machinery is often disrupted so the cancer mutations are in fact enriched for DNAs1 hypersensitive sites. And these are very cancer type specific and likely due to the promoter activity and nucleotide excision repair and so on and so forth. So if you look across different types of cancer, you see that promoters have a large number of mutations and then enhancers have fewer mutations and then heterochromatin has the most mutations. So it's kind of interesting that this is flipped differently for different types of tumors. So for a melanoma, for example, you see many more DNA hypersensitive sites being mutated in uh, promoters as opposed to uh, other 
tumor types where the promoters are in fact depleted compared to other regions. Again, the mutation rate can vary by the epigenomic landscape and in particular with a minor groove orientation. So depending on whether the major groove or the minor groove is facing the histone, the mutations that are actually more associated with, so the, basically both the stromatic and the germline mutation rate show a 10 base pair periodicity in nucleosome occupied DNA. And this periodicity actually tracks the DNA minor groove facing toward and away the histones. And the orientation of the periodicity depends on the mutation processes that are active in each tissue. And this in fact contributes to the ATCG 10 base pair periodicity in eukaryotic genomes. So if you look at this you know, periodicity, it is actually found both in the somatic mutations and the variation and the divergence, as well as this um, weak base pair periodicity. So this is one more thing that one needs to correct for. And then the last thing is, if you look at the uh, different chromatin states that a location is found in, this is uh, something that also correlates very heavily. So regions that are in promoters or in enhancers or in poised are in fact showing this gradient of mutation. And then these open chromatin regions have the lowest mutation rate. And then the highest mutation rate is, in those, is found in those poised regions. So you can distinguish accessible regions as you know, their own class and they have the lowest mutation rate. And that's likely driven by the accessibility of the repair machinery. And then outside these DNAs hypersensitive regions, the chromatin states vary greatly with promoters being much more hypermutable than enhancers, than transcribed regions and so on and so forth. So you can trace these across different chromatin states, but also across different patients. So here, this is again, our own work with Richard Salari. And this is looking at the mutations that are happening at the number of mutations that are found in different patients. And you can see here that as you go from patient to patient, the same chromatin state shows an increase in the uh, mutation rate. So that's another thing that you need to control for when selecting for uh, these regions. So MutigDB is one of these tools that has been developed to uh, call somatic mutations relative to the background by computing these aggregate gene scores. And again, that's a tool by Gat Getz over at the Broad, which accounts for many covariates, including patient-specific effects, gene-specific effects, conservation, transcriptional activity, DNA replication timing, chromatin state, to construct a background model. And then you call significant mutations compared to that background model. You then aggregate the gene scores across the tumor and establish a significance threshold to control the FDR. And that's how you can uh, identify true drivers. And this is work that we've done in collaboration with Malin Rasmussen, uh, who was a visiting student in the group, uh, where we can detect non-coding driver and regions by accounting for many of these details that I told you about regarding the mutational uh, background. So that's non-coding driver detect, uh, based on what would be the expected mutation rate and what is the observed mutation rate. And for that expected mutation rate, you can basically combine many of these features uh, that I told you about. So now you can ask, well, great, we've identified these. Uh, oh, I see a chat here. Why would something mutate with 10 base pair periodicity? So that has to do with the properties of how the DNA is actually facing the histones. It's not entirely clear as to why the, you know, th this side would be mutating more. It's something that was very unexpected when it was found. But the idea is that the repair machinery can access the DNA differently if the mutation is um, more accessible to the DNA repair. So if the DNA is actually accessible, that's, that's easy, you, you just go there. But if the DNA is actually wrapped around the histones, how close the repair machinery can get to that damaged site is in fact what can, can determine that uh, periodicity. Does that make sense, Aitish? Yeah, got it. 
Okay, so we've now controlled for all these things. We've identified a bunch of non-coding drivers. We, the, the question is, how can they possibly act? So they can act in many different ways by changing that circuitry that we've been talking about in these other lectures. So they can lead to the gain of a motif. You know, maybe this promoter region was not bound by the TF, but now that there's a mutation, it can be bound. Or you could lose a motif. The transcription factor was bound, and now it can no longer bind. Or you might actually change the uh, affinity of the transcription factor itself. You might have you know, more of these uh, factor or less of that factor. You might also rewire the local context of a particular gene. You could also mutate motifs to either gain or lose microRNA binding sites in the 3' ETR. And you could also have sponge uh, microRNAs that are lost. So what are these sponge microRNAs? These are, sorry, these are uh, sponge pseudogenes, which when expressed can suck up all of the microRNAs that would otherwise go and repress other genes and therefore cause this global change in the binding of a one particular microRNA. So these non-coding mutations can affect immunogenesis in many different ways by gain and loss of a motif, by change of binding, or structural variants that bring together genes, or mutation of microRNAs, or pseudogene uh, sponge uh, changes. Again, this convergence can allow you to now look for distant regulatory sites that are all converging onto regulation of the same target gene. And some of those can actually come from the same chromosome or from distant regions of that chromosome, or even from distant regions across different chromosomes. So every one patient might have a different mutation, but across all these patients, when you sum it up, you can see these recurrent hotspots of mutations from that heterogeneity. So again, this conversion model is looking at many regulatory motifs within a common enhancer, many enhancers for a common gene, many genes for a common pathway, and many pathways resulting in conversion functions. So there's this hierarchical model that can aggregate mutations across multiple levels. And with uh, Richard, we define this concept of a regulatory plexus, which is this you know, weaving together of the genome from many loci, all targeting the same common target gene. So looking for these recurrent non-coding mutations in these regulatory plexus, we can number one, construct a plexus for each gene, then map non-coding driver regions onto that plexus, and then recognize driver target genes, even when there are no protein altering mutations. So you can basically predict the impact of different mutations across different patients, and then aggregate that impact and then coalesce it, converge it onto the common target gene. And then you can go in and experimentally validate some of those non-coding drivers through either high throughput functional dissection and validation of those non-coding drivers by synthesizing the mutated sequence, and then using some of the tools that we're going to talk about in the last lecture, such as the self-transcribing reporter assays or luciferase reporters, or single cell genetic screens with uh, CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A. And again, we're going to talk about those in the last lecture. And then you can also validate them in model organisms by going in and changing those genes and seeing whether the impact lead to changes in the replication or changes in the tumor and so on and so forth. So that has all been about sequence-based drivers, but we're not constrained to only look for sequence-based drivers. There could actually be epimutations that drive uh, genome alterations by simply changing an epigenomic region. So you could actually have an epigenomic alteration as a cancer driver event. Uh, for example, if you look for what are these mutations, you can see that many of them are in fact affecting regulatory proteins. So that suggests that if these same regulatory proteins are simply changing in their activity through other uh, roles, through other sort of non-mutational means that could also change. And that's the concept of an epimutator gene. These are global epigenomic alterations. These epimutator genes control global epigenome maintenance and wiring and then could be exploited in the cancer for global gene regulatory alterations. So for example, ECH2, which is a polycom repressor, or DNA methylases and demethylases are very frequently changed 
and they can result in global epigenome-wide changes. In the same way that increased mutations can play the numbers and have the tumor gain functions, even though many of its cells will die, this epigenomic dysre dysregulation, even though it's global, can basically lead to selective events that target specific, specific pathways. So this can go through nucleosome uh, remodelers, DNA methylation, uh, establishment or erasing, and also histone modifications. And these can actually guide the type of therapeutics that you should look for. So you could diagnose cancer as alter differentiation, and you could treat the cancer by reprogramming the cancer cells towards normal development. And you can also study heterogeneity of the tumor at the single cell level. And we're gonna talk about single cell genomics next uh, lecture. So single cell RNAs, it can capture the diversity of clonal groups. And you can also call copy number variants based on clustered expression differences in the same genomic location. So you could look across the tumor for locations that are increasingly higher or increasingly lower. And you can um, use that to call copy number changes from the single cell data directly. The heterogeneity can also be in the tumor microenvironment. So if you look at the tumor cells or the non-tumor cells, there's a huge number of T cells and B cells and macrophages and epithelial cells, natural killer cells that are surrounding the tumor. And you could also reveal that diversity of that microenvironment by sequencing the gene expression patterns of the stromal cells and the immune cells and how they're interacting with the tumor. There could also be heterogeneity in cell cycle stage and cellular state. So as the cells are progressing through that cell cycle, you can basically capture that and then look where is each cell in the cell cycle and then hierarchically group the cells based on the tumor heterogeneity between different lesions, between different cell types in the same lesion, between cells of the same type, and also during the cell cycle for a given cell. By matching single cell DNA-seq and single cell RNA-seq, you can actually infer the clonality directly and then build models that allow you to infer what are the mutations of uh, a tumor and how is that associated with changes in expression for the same tumor cell. The last topic, which is extremely important, is uh, the immune interactions of the tumor. Again, the tumor is dependent and acting on the microenvironment. So the tumor must be understood in the context of the microenvironment. And every tumor has a variety of cells in the microenvironment that provide key interactions that either repress or promote its growth. So again, the tumor cell is found in the context of these fibroblast, endothelial cells, pericytes, these immune inflammatory cells, and you know, both cancer stem cells and cancer cells and invasive cancer cells. So you can basically look at how is that microenvironment interacting with the tumor through uh, all of these different types of interactions. So the tumor is actually actively rewiring the immune profile of the surrounding cells. So this immunoediting function happens very early during the tumor e emergence. And the tumor evades the adaptive immune system by altering its own immune profile. And this is simply Darwinian evolution. There's positive selection for tumor cells that go unrecognized. And therefore, the immune system is actually selectively keeping those cells that it cannot recognize by killing the cells that it can recognize. And therefore, the tumor represses the immune recognition through multiple means by either lowering its own antigenic profile. So basically, favoring mutations that are less easily recognized by the immune system, therefore less antigenic. It can also decrease its antigen presentation. So it can repress the major histocompatibility complex, the MHC. It can establish immunosuppressive immune environments by down-regulating cytokine signaling, repressing T cell activity, reprogramming T regulatory cells and dendritic cells. So these cells are in fact constantly talking with each other and the tumor can basically send signals to the immune cells saying, oh, everything's going fine. You can just go back to rest. Things are going great. And these repressive uh, signals are, is something that the tumor itself will send, pretending that it's one of those other immune cells that normally repress uh, the immune system, such as T-regulatory cells. It can directly replace, repress the T-cell effectors by upregulating T-cell inhibitory ligands. And it can also recruit 
suppressive immune cell types. You can uh, recruit immunosuppressive, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, MDSCs, and it can escape immune surveillance. So these tumor immune interactions are involved in progression, in therapy, and in relapse. So there's new coding mutations that generate new antigens. So the immune system cannot recognize the tumor as non self and targeted. Again, tumors downregulate their own uh, antigen presentation. They downregulate the immune system. And there's many therapeutics that actually target that. And that's the whole basis of immunotherapy, which has been one of the most successful interventions against tumors, where the immune system helps to select clones that are not recognized by attacking these highly antigenic uh, clones. And then the tumor decoy cells can also potentially overwhelm the immune system and let other cells survive. So you could actually have selection for extremely um, immunogenic cells from the tumor that will then trigger an enormous immune cells, uh, response towards only those cells, allowing other cells to evade the tumor. Again, we find recurrent mutations in the HLA genes that refresh the MHC antigen presentation. So the tumor generates inhibitory ligands. Immunotherapies can reverse this and promote T cell activity. So anti-immune diseases can also help trigger immune response against cancer. So you can, you know, there's this interplay where on one side you have uh, immunosuppression, on the other side you have basically tumor. So every tumor cell can basically recognize and speak to the, the receptors uh, that are inhibiting T cells or activating T cells. And these tumors can basically generate immune ligands that suppress T cell activity. And immune therapies can reverse this effect and promote T cell activity. And autoimmune diseases can actually help trigger immune response against the cancer. So if your body is used to attacking itself, as soon as a tumor starts having a lot of antigens, the body will attack the tumor more easily. So there's, you know, usually the tumor will interact with these T cells and will suppress T cells through PD-1. But if you basically have a PD-1 blockade that blocks the receptors, then you're basically blocking the inhibition of the immune system that means that it overactivates the immune system, which can certainly help fight the tumor, but it can also le lead to uh, autoimmunity. So that's you know, a double-edged sword. And new antigen diversity can predict immunotherapy success. The higher the mutational load, the more likely you are to succeed. So mutational frequency and new antigen load is correlated with response to checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. And the intuition is that even if the T cells aren't immunosuppressed, they still need targets. So the more targets you give it, the more likely it is to actually respond. And you can actually computationally use deep learning or other methods to predict neoantigen and neoepitope recognition. So to know if a coding mutation will become a neoepitope, you can actually predict the likelihood of presentation of antigens through this MHC uh, position specific uh, prediction. So this is position-specific scoring matrix, and there's newer versions that actually use neural networks and deep learning to basically predict whether, given your specific immune system status, whether a particular sequence of the tumor will be a neoantigen or not. Again, tumors vary dramatically in their neoantigen landscape. The abundance is highly correlated with mutation rate, and these neoantigens can be oncogenes or passenger mutations. And the intratumor heterogeneity of your neoantigen landscape can predict whether immunotherapy will be successful or not. And based on your T cell repertoire, this can actually be adjusted in a personalized way. So how do the T cells recognize the multitude of antigenic peptides that's being presented by the MHC? Every T cell generates a unique T cell receptor or TCR through this VDJ recombination and this region uh, that interfaces with the MHC is the CDR3. And you have a large number of exons for each of these. And you select only one of those. And that creates an enormous diversity of 10 to the 15 different T cell receptors. And that's what allows your immune system to recognize this enormous diversity of potential 
antigens uh, in the world. These infiltrating T cells have a very distinct repertoire and you can determine it across different types and start predicting it and matching it. And you can detect antigen specific T cells using DNA barcoded peptides and MHC multimers. And you can actually use that to start predicting how will the immune system of a person respond to the antigens of a tumor. And that also allows you to start designing personalized neoantigen cancer vaccines. The goal is to utilize patient-specific neoantigen profiles to develop cancer vaccines that then assist with anti-tumor response. And the hypothesis is that the neoantigen-specific vaccines will promote anti-tumor response by T cells with T cells receptors that recognize the neoantigens. The challenges are number one, how do you identify the patient-specific HLA allele-specific peptides? And number two, how do you validate that indeed the synthetic peptides will assist the tumor response in real patients? And that's what Nirha Cohen and uh, Kathy Wu have been doing, uh, both in the clinic and in a startup that, that basically trying to get at um, sort of new therapeutics. And they've been basically predicting these HLA allele-specific peptides using this combination of high throughput assays with a neural network predictive model where you can create a large number of experimental data sets and then feed them into a model that will then predict how an, uh, a, per a person will respond. And then you want to validate the clinical efficiency of these synthetic peptide mutations using personalized uh, vaccine treatments. And this is just some responses that basically show that many of the patients indeed showed this uh, clear response to the new antigens. And then the, the patient T cells will then recognize the mutated epitopes more efficiently than the wild type epitopes. And you see complete response uh, for some of the patients where the tumor just completely goes away or partial response followed by immunotherapy, which will then lead to complete response after that. A CAR T cell uh, therapies are another popular immunotherapy that actually uses the targeting elements of a monoclonal antibody, which is raised against the recurrent tumor antigens, fused with a signaling component of a T cell receptor to direct cytotoxic T cells against the tumor cells. So then the idea is that you're taking the cells of the patient, the immune cells of the patient, you're training them to recognize the antigens of the tumor, and then you're reinserting them, effectively creating a population of immune cells inside the patient that are now trained to fight their own tumors. And you let the immune system of the patient then take care of the tumors rather than try to you know, kill the tumor directly. So that allows for robust polyclonal T cell response without antigen presentation, uh, unlike checkpoint blockade therapies. And then these artificial receptors are directly integrated into the patient's immune cells through adaptive uh, transfer. So you're basically taking out the cells, retraining them, fusing them so that they now have a recognition specifically for the tumor of that patient. And then you're, you know, helping them treat their own tumor. And then this happens through these bispecific T cell engagers that allow you to have an antigen specific presentation and then coupled with the response element from the T cells. And that allows you to now start building this uh, in interface of the tumor, the immune cells surrounding it, and then this microenvironment uh, interaction. So again, immunotherapies are just one part of the drug treatment picture. There's a, an enormous number of uh, pathways for the tumors. And then the immune system uh, interactions is only some of those uh, pathways. So you have to think of immunotherapy in the context of the whole tumor. So that's all we have to cover for today. So we talked about the basics of the hallmarks of cancer and then how we can identify those hallmarks through exome sequencing, through whole genome sequencing, and also beyond just sequencing with epi mutations and just changes in gene expression and in the epigenome. And then lastly, this interface between the tumor and its microenvironment in the context of immunotherapy. All right, let's see who feels that they've learned something today. Lovely. So uh, 75, 25, zero, zero, zero. Okay, guys. So uh, that's it. That's the last lecture before the quiz. So tomorrow we're going to have the mentoring session again, where we're going to talk about your mid-course reports.
so that we can give you feedback as to where you stand on the project. And then on Tuesday, we have the quiz. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. Thank you.